What's up guys, it's Aaron Itmar. So the other day I was looking at the Smash Ultimate character select screen and kind of just stopping and reflecting on just how much content we have in this game. I mean, it is a ridiculous amount. And then that made me think about the very first entry and just how little content that game actually had. And that got me thinking about things that weren't meant to be seen in the game, that weren't finished or were scrapped and that we just weren't supposed to know about, but because we're in the year 2019, we have discovered. So I only want to talk about things that are hard confirmed, either by developer interviews or by actual data that we can find within the game itself. So by this point, everyone sort of knows the story of Smash 64's development, so I'm not going to bore you with a ton of detail here, but I don't think it would be a complete video if I didn't mention Dragon King The Fighting Game. This was the working title of what would come to be Smash 64, however in Dragon King they simply had fairly featureless characters and it was more of a way of developing the engine and getting the gameplay down than actually focusing on the characters. Masahiro Sakurai and Satoru Iwata developed this as a side hobby, and the story goes that Sakurai thought using Nintendo characters would increase the charm of the game and make it more welcoming to players. Nintendo higher-ups rejected the idea, but the two continued to use them in the hopes that showing a usable demo would change their mind, which of course it inevitably did. Dragon King was never really available in any kind of a playable state, and there's no footage available. The only thing we have are these few screenshots. But with Dragon King now Super Smash Bros., let's start small and take a look at some of the beta stages that had tiny adjustments prior to the final game. Remember, this game had only 9 versus mode stages, so the adjustments were very, very minimal. Many stages shown off in pre-release images had minor updates to them in the final cut, such as model sizes being slightly adjusted, textures and colors being changed, or digging up and planting some brand new flowers. But Smash 64 also has some really cool scrapped stages, but I guess a better way to describe it is probably that they were just testing stages. The first stage is named Small, and the layout of the stage is pretty identical to Dreamland, with of course some minor tweaks here and there. The background is also the same used on Dreamland, as is the base of the stage with its old pineapple look. This is basically just assumed to be the testing or an early stage for Dreamland itself, though naturally it doesn't have wispy or more of the Kirby-ish aspects to it. It may have been used to test the three platform layout alongside the stage's actual shape, but then when it came time for the actual Dreamland stage, they found it easier to start on a blank canvas. We'll never really know, it's kind of just an interesting duplicate. The other stage is called New, and this is absolutely meant to be a testing stage in my mind, and it's even flagged in the game as being earlier than Small, the previous stage. New has a very random layout, with platforms and walls placed randomly, a very oblong looking shape off to the side, and above all, several invisible walls. Also, these flowers are going crazy! Look at them go! I'd be quite surprised if this stage was actually any kind of a real attempt at a possible stage, because it really just seems like they dumped objects here to see how it interacted with both the environment and the players. But the meat and potatoes of Smash has always been which characters will get in. It's pretty wild to think about a world where Smash was coming out and there wasn't a huge internet sensation guessing who would be in, and a whole host of reaction videos about each and every edition. Of course we got the original 12 veterans, but in classic Smash fashion, a few characters were planned who needed to be scrapped. The first one is Bowser, who Miyamoto cites in an interview as being one of the characters who will be present in Smash. Now it's possible that Miyamoto simply misspoke about the characters to be added, but of all the characters he mentioned, Bowser's the only one who wasn't in the final game. Furthermore, Sakurai himself later answered a question from a fan on the Smash 64 website, which after release he often did. This person asked if Bowser and King Dedede were playable because, in the classic 90s and early 2000s style, everyone's friend on the playground always heard some big secret about the latest game. Sakurai denied that either character was in the game, however he goes on to say that they were both partially complete but ended up being scrapped. So that's Bowser and now a second character, King Dedede, that were intended to be featured in the game. But we're not done yet. Mewtwo was also planned to appear in Smash 64, but was also cut. Again on the Smash website, a poll was run entitled, If There Was a Smash 2, asking players who they'd like to see in a sequel. It was basically the very first Smash ballot. Among the top 10 was Bowser, King DDD, and Mewtwo. Sakurai actually footnotes at the bottom of the page stating that all three of these characters were planned to be featured in the first game, but they were all cut. It's really unclear how far along development for any of them were, but they were at the very least intended to be seen in the game. Now the final character planned and then scrapped was Marth. That's right, we have 10 Marths in Ultimate now to make up for the fact that Marth was scrapped in Smash 64. 
In a book titled The Making of Fire Emblem, 25 Years of Development Secrets, a section was dedicated to the franchise's inclusion in Smash, and Sakurai himself discusses the development of these characters. Sakurai dives right in, saying that the design of Marth's playstyle was intended for Smash 64, and it was meant to be a direct counter to Link. While Link is a sword user, he has many items, and on top of that, his sword movements are far more strong and direct. With Marth, he planned a far more technical use of the sword to be reflected in his moveset. Link was sort of forced to be a sword user, while Marth was sort of raised and taught the art of the sword. On top of this, Sakurai stated that of the franchises popular at the time of 64's development, Fire Emblem was very high, with multiple popular titles in Japan. Unfortunately, due to development time, they were unable to include Marth. In fact, many features were barely finished by their deadlines for the full game. The four secret characters that we did get were chosen because they could reuse many of the same animations from other fighters. So Marth would have taken too much work, he had to get cut, and it wouldn't be until Melee that he finally debuted. It's common knowledge by now that Final Smashes were intended to debut all the way back in Smash 64, but of course it wouldn't be until Brawl that they did. Some voice work was done for these Ultimate movesets before the idea was scrapped. Kirby has unused clips that we can only assume are for his Final Smash. Fox says, Which means, come on, or let's go, and it probably would have been used when calling his R-Wing. Pikachu has two overpowered screams that are very similar to the ones that he uses during his final Smash today, but they couldn't have been for Volt Tackle back in Smash 64 because that move didn't exist yet. So it's very likely it could have been for something very similar in his final Smash. Captain Falcon has his classic, Come on, Blue Falcon! And these are almost exactly the same as his use in his final Smash. And lastly, Ness calls out PK Starstorm, which is his final Smash today and was clearly intended to be his final Smash from the very beginning. PK Starstorm! Aside from this, we have just a handful of UI that got changed for the full release. Two characters have changed series symbols. First is Link, who had an upside down piece of the Triforce, presumably the Triforce of Courage. This of course got changed to be the whole Triforce. The other is Yoshi, who had a similar egg shape that did not have any spots. In the final version, there are see-through spots on the symbol. Crates didn't have the Smash Bros symbol, instead they were blank, and the character select screen's hidden characters had a totally different UI, among other things. Finally, there's a yellow Pikachu and a yellow Jigglypuff stock icon that exists in the game, but it isn't used for anything, possibly hinting at the intended inclusion of a fourth alternate for both characters. Because their costumes were all the same, just with different colors, this was really, really easy, so it's very likely this was possible. Shortly after the unanticipated success of the first Super Smash Bros., Masahiro Sakurai and HAL Laboratory sat down with Nintendo to discuss developing a sequel for the soon-to-be-debuted GameCube. A huge part of the GameCube was its increased processing power, and Nintendo wanted to show this off by having a full motion video trailer shown at E3, which they ended up doing. This trailer would then go on to be the actual opening of the game on the disc. Sakurai saw this as the quote, biggest project he had ever led up to that point. While the original Smash was mostly a big testing ground for the concept behind the game, its success proved that Melee really needed to have the absolute best quality possible. As a result, a ton of content was considered and even partially developed for the game that never ended up seeing the light of day, at least on the GameCube. Just like in Smash 64, many stages received minor updates between their beta and demo appearances and the final look. One such stage is Great Bay, which initially had the laboratory as a part of the stage. Players could jump on top of it and even go inside the lab itself. This was changed in the final game, making the laboratory simply a part of the background and you couldn't interact with it at all. However, the inside of the lab still actually has some textures and models inside of it, which are left over from when this idea still existed. Green Greens also had a drastically different look. While the stage layout remained very similar, the overall appearance used to look far more realistic. The final stage looks more cartoony, which better resembles the Kirby franchise's overall aesthetic. Another Kirby stage, Fountain of Dreams, had a different layout in its early days. It was missing the very top platform, having only one on the left and one on the right. Interestingly, aside from this missing platform, the stage itself looks pretty identical to what we received in the final game. Icicle Mountain, the seemingly never-ending stage from Melee's Adventure Mode, also featured an enemy change on the stage. In the Japanese release of Ice Climber, the Topi enemies were designed based on seals. However, in the release to Western audiences, this enemy was changed to a more obscure and original design, likely to avoid any controversy with seal clubbing. 
This change from the original NES game translates over into Smash, with Icicle Mountain having the seal topi in the Japanese release, but the newly created design for the international version. Pokemon Stadium's screen was shown blank in early screenshots, though this may be because the stage was simply not completely developed yet. Rainbow Cruise looked far bleaker than it does in the final version of the game. Actually, it kind of reminds me of the treatment that Mushroomy Kingdom got in Brawl, just this weird desert version of what's supposed to be a bright and colorful level. Temple had some platforms that aren't in the final stage. Interestingly, while this isn't in the game, the special movie still has these platforms intact. Yoshi's Island had considerable changes to its layout. The hole is much wider in the beta, the rotating blocks are in a different layout, including some that go vertically, and there are also note blocks which allow you to bounce if you land on them, and they don't appear in the final game at all. And on the topic of Yoshi, Yoshi's story has a drastic amount of change. The final stage is basically a battlefield with walls that go all the way down but the beta had some crazy stuff going on. The platforms seem to be hovering over either a hole or ground that is much lower, and they aren't in every shot, which means that they probably would have been moving platforms. The slopes were huge, enough for Captain Falcon and Bowser to be fighting on, and they also have these things on a path that I have actually no idea what they are. They vaguely remind me of the paths that fuzzies travel on, but obviously those aren't fuzzies, so I... I have no clue. As for stages that aren't featured in the game at all, Melee has quite a few. First up is the stage Akanea, a Fire Emblem stage named after the continent in the games which star Marth. This stage currently can't be accessed in any way. Any attempt crashes the game, and all we know is that in the game files, a slot was made for the stage. Sakurai also confirmed this suspicion on the Smash Brothers website when a fan asked about a Fire Emblem stage in the game. He stated that they planned to include the stage originally, and that it would include onagers hurling boulders as well as dragons and mages in some way. The stage of course was scrapped, which is why fights with Marth and Roy in single player tend to take place on Temple. There was also the idea of a stage based on Sprout Tower from Violet City found in Pokemon Gold and Silver, however this idea never made it past the planning stages. Then there's the stage called Dummy an entirely black stage that apparently only has a single platform in the middle, although when I tried to load the stage, my characters just fell forever. While ordinarily the stage can't be accessed because it doesn't have any background music assigned, modding this allows the player to play on the stage. The stage also has blast zones, but they are very far away, and the game will crash if the player goes near them. There's speculation that the dummy stage is used as the result screen, however, there has been no evidence to prove or contradict this. But there are some properly playable leftover stages. Ice Top and 10-2 are identical stages that can be found in the data and are intended to be a second Ice Climber stage. While every stage has its own proper name, they are also numbered for adventure mode, so Icicle Mountain is 10-1, and this second stage would have been 10-2. Again on the Melee website, Sakurai stated that this stage was planned and scrapped, and that the stage would have been called Summit. This of course would later be realized as the stage for Ice Climbers in Brawl. Following this is Test, which based on the name is obviously a testing stage for the game. Test is a gigantic stage with largely untextured platforms that stretch for a long distance. The background had much speculation around here. Because of the low quality, many people thought it could be either a restaurant around Japan or an image of some of the HAL Laboratory offices. However, it's been confirmed that the background is actually a picture of Cafe Verona in Palo Alto, California, which is a common image used for testing purposes in OpenGL rendering. The final unused stage is called T-Seek, which was going to be used as a unique target test stage for Sheik before it was decided that Zelda and Sheik would simply share the same stage. This stage didn't seem to get very far in development, consisting of only a single platform with three targets. But now let's talk about characters that were planned for Melee's release but ended up on the cutting room floor. By now, it's well known that Hideo Kojima, creator of the Metal Gear Solid franchise, is a close personal friend with Sakurai, and he asked Sakurai if Snake could be a playable character in Melee. At the time of this proposal, however, Melee was far too deep into development for them to have time to create a whole new character for the game, so Snake just wasn't feasible. He of course showed up later in Brawl and then returned in Ultimate, making these rumors of his inclusion in Melee somewhat valid. Sonic was another character considered for Melee. The then head of Sonic Team, Yuji Naka, spoke with Edge Magazine and said that Sonic was considered, but ultimately not added again due to time constraints, likely because Nintendo wanted the game available for the GameCube's launch. 
Sonic was another third party which has since become a staple in Smash, first appearing in Brawl and being in every game since. Other characters were considered, but passed over for one reason or another. Sakurai was very insistent that the game should have a character representing the classic NES era, and many games can fit this bill. Before finally settling on Ice Climbers, Balloon Fighter, Urban Champion, Bubbles from Clue Clue Land, and Excite Biker were all considered as possible candidates. Sakurai also confirmed in a 2016 interview with Nico Nico that Ayumi Tachibana from Famicom Detective Club was considered playable for Melee, but because of its Japan exclusivity, she would be an incredibly unfamiliar character to international players. Mother 3's Lucas was also intended to replace Ness as the representative from the Mother series. Mother 3 was actively being developed for the N64 at the time, titled Earthbound 64, and this would have been a good opportunity to show off the new character. However, Mother 3 was scrapped for the 64 before being moved to the Game Boy Advance, so Ness remained. It kind of makes you wonder how Smash would feel without Ness being a veteran character for each and every game. Takamaru from the mysterious Murasame Castle was also briefly considered. He ended up being passed on for Melee as his franchise is very obscure and Japan exclusive, so this was another case where international audiences would be very unfamiliar with that character. Sakurai also stated on the Melee website that he'd like to see Mach Rider in the game simply because Mach Rider has such a cool name. And lastly, Wario was a big contender for Melee. On the Smash website, Sakurai said that if he had time to add just one more character to Melee, Wario would be his pick. This is naturally why Wario is one of the earlier characters in Brawl's lineup, shown at Brawl's very first reveal. A few characters have also been discussed since Melee has come out, but Sakurai himself has never actually said that these characters were considered. At the time of Melee's development, Rareware was a very closely related developer to Nintendo. Sakurai has been questioned if any properties from those games would join Smash. He responded that characters such as James Bond or Banjo and Kazooie from Rare would be difficult due to copyright issues. Particularly, James Bond was a hard no, not only because of the violent nature of his potential moveset, but that copyright issues with the films, as well as including the real-life likeness of James Bond's actor, could cause huge development delays. Despite this, the motion sensor bomb in Melee's international release is based on its depiction in GoldenEye 007, and the Japanese appearance of the motion sensor bomb, as well as the cloaking device, are based on items found in Perfect Dark, another rare title. Speaking of items, there were a few that were scrapped prior to release. Ditto was to appear out of Pokeballs and remains a part of the game's code, though incomplete. In its existing form, Ditto simply appears, says its name, and then vanishes. Were it to be fully functioning, Ditto would transform into the player that summoned it and would fight for them. As we know, this function would finally come to be an ultimate, though it was scrapped from Melee likely due to lack of development time. Assist capsules were also an idea that ultimately was passed on for Melee, as confirmed by Sakurai on the Smash website. These would have worked exactly as assist trophies do in later games, similar to Pokeballs, but for characters that aren't Pokemon. And speaking of characters, Sukapon was a planned character that was going to be used as an item. Fighters would have been able to ride on Sukapon, however, this too was cut only to return in a future game. The content doesn't stop there though. A few roster-wide animations have been found within the code of the game that were ultimately passed on for use in the final version. However, with the power of technology, we've been able to dig up these animations. First is a brief highlight intro for each and every character in the game. This is assumed to be for All-Star mode, announcing each character just before the fight. This was likely passed on as All-Star mode evolved into more than single character fights, so these intros would be out of place halfway through the run. They're also a bit redundant in the All-Star rest area because you get a preview of who you're going to fight just before you enter the light. The second instance of unused animations are pairs of animations for every character, titled Selected and Selected Wait. These were likely animations intended for the character select screen when a character is chosen. Smash 64 has this on its character select screen, and as Melee is the sequel, it makes sense that they would use what is established in the previous entry as the base for the new game. However, of course Melee ultimately decided on simply having renders for each character rather than full-on animations. While the selected wait animations go relatively unused, many of the selected animations would be repurposed as victory animations for each character. These animations would also be used later on in Brawl as idling victory poses and taunts. The final interesting tidbit actually exists in the game, but in ways you wouldn't really notice. These exist in trophies with reflective parts. In modeling, you need a special texture specifically for the reflection, because otherwise it wouldn't be reflecting anything. 
so many trophies have some interesting textures. The Ayumi Tachibana trophy has a cat's face for its reflection. Fire Kirby has, for some reason, a baby's face. The Metroid trophy has the Super Metroid title screen, which is a neat little easter egg. And similarly, Metal Mario has a reflection of the Yoshi's Island stage. The Ocarina of Time trophy has a reflection of the sky. And finally, multiple trophies use this castle image, which is actually a screenshot of Asohe Castle from Earthbound 64. The Forbidden Seven are a fan name given to seven characters whose data was found within Brawl's files, but who never got included in the game for one reason or another. These names are Dixie, Dr. Mario, Mewtwo, Roy, Pra Mai, Toon Sheik, and Toon Zelda. Now most of these are just pretty straightforward and you can't really make an argument against them, with the exception of one. Dixie is of course Dixie Kong, and she was intended to be a newcomer as a duo character next to Diddy Kong. In Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest, Diddy and Dixie are the two playable characters and will often swap places in order to use their different abilities. This was intended to be how the character would work, having them swap back and forth as part of their moveset. Technical issues halted this idea and Diddy was instead added as a solo fighter. Dr. Mario was also intended to return as a clone of Mario. There are even files in the game named Mario D which were previously thought to be a debug character. However, with Smash 4 bringing Dr. Mario back and his files being named Mario D in that game, this is further evidence that Mario D in Brawl was likely meant to be Dr. Mario. Mewtwo seemed to have decent progress in his development for the game before being suddenly cut. He had an unused fanfare, an effects file for his psychic energy moves, and a Wii Remote selection sound for the character select screen. Why he was cut is unknown. Roy was also intended before being cut and also had an unused fanfare in the game's files. I mentioned that one of the characters is debatable and that is Pra Mai. There are several theories regarding this character slot. The most common is Plusle and Minot, relating to their Japanese names Parasuru and Minot. The trouble is the only other duo character, Ice Climbers, both have separate character files for each fighter, but Pra Mai is one file. So this would be a strange disconnect in the programming, as it would make sense that if they were going to do another duo character, they would use a previous duo character as a base. And with Diddy and Dixie planning on being another duo character and them being separate, it makes even less sense if this were the case. Another theory is that Pra Mai is Japanese that stands for every player. Mai can be translated to every, while Pra can be translated to player. From this, two theories have sprouted up. The first is that it's simply a file name for the random button on the CSS. The other is that it means the Mies, which would be customizable in any way and would make sense as being abbreviated as every player. Personally, I lean towards Mies, as Sakurai has stated in interviews that they were initially considered for Brawl, but were ultimately passed on. So perhaps they laid a very basic groundwork before finally deciding Mies couldn't be in Brawl. Toon Zelda and Toon Cheek are pretty self-explanatory. Brawl took Young Link and changed him into Toon Link to represent Wind Waker and a totally different style of Zelda game. Maybe they wanted a Toon Zelda to join Toon Link. Toon Sheik does seem to trip people up, however, as there has never been a Sheik in the Wind Waker branch of Zelda games. It's theorized that this could have been Toon Tetra, the original form Zelda took in Wind Waker before being awoken as the princess. A counter to this is that Twilight Princess Zelda also has a Sheik transformation in Brawl, yet Sheik did not appear in Twilight Princess at all. So it truly could have been a Toon Sheik that was made specifically just for Smash. Either of these theories seem plausible, but you'd think that if they planned for Tetra to be the playable Toon transformation, then the files would be named Toon Tetra, not Toon Sheik. Aside from the hard evidence that these characters had plans to exist in some form in Brawl, there were additional characters that were considered but were dropped for one reason or another. Pac-Man was considered and was a request by Shigeru Miyamoto himself, but Sakurai said that Pac-Man's pizza-shaped design was a bit too far-fetched. Animal Crossing's Villager was also considered during the game's planning stages, but Sakurai felt he wasn't suited for battle. And as stated before, Miis were also considered, but Sakurai felt that it didn't really seem right at the time for Miis to be punching and kicking. They were also passed on to reduce online bullying. All three of these characters, despite being rejected in previous games, showed up in Smash for 3DS and Wii U. Geno was also considered for Brawl as he is a personal favorite of Sakurai's, as well as being immensely popular and fitting in the Smash universe very seamlessly. For Brawl, legal issues with Square Enix prevented Geno from being added in, and even though Square characters have since been included, Geno has never joined the battle fully. 
Blastoise was considered to be a part of Pokemon Trainer's team, but Squirtle was decided on because he, quote, established himself as a character better than Blastoise, which probably just means he has more personality. On top of that, the balance between having Stage 1, Stage 2, and Final Evolution Pokemon, as well as their varying sizes, gave the character a deeper playstyle. Finally, Crystal from Star Fox was considered, but time concerns had Wolf chosen over Crystal because Wolf could rely on Fox and Falco's pre-existing model and attacks, while Crystal would need to be made from scratch. And that is literally only the discussion on characters. There's still a ton of unused data, but this game had the most potential for characters that never made it. The characters who did make it into Smash also had some plans that would be scrapped. Captain Falcon had an unused ending to his final Smash, which would later go on to appear in Smash for 3DS and Wii U and Ultimate. Kirby has an animation which indicates that he would charge up and be able to walk around with his hammer. This was passed on in Brawl, but ultimately became reality in 3DS and Wii U. Zero Suit Samus has a handful of unused animations, which seem to suggest that her plasma whip would be able to grab items and subsequently throw them. The theory on why this was passed on is that it would be too difficult for the game to decide what to do if a character and an item were overlapping. Fox and Falco both have animations for what seems to be their blasters misfiring. This is probably meant to be a punishment for overusing their blasters, but it ended up being passed on. Diddy Kong has a pair of laughing animations relating to his down special, Banana Toss. This would probably be played after one of his bananas tripped an opponent. Wolf has an unused animation that is simply a copy of Fox's Rapid Kick. Because Wolf is heavily based on both Fox and Falco, this was probably brought over during that time and it was simply left over when developers decided on a different jab. Peach was probably meant to have Perry, her parasol from Super Princess Peach, in her moveset rather than her normal parasol. The file naming conventions for both the Perry trophy and Peach's files match up exactly, and so this was probably in the game at some point before they decided to switch it back. Finally, Pokemon Trainer has a set of jumping, falling, and landing animations. These are probably meant for Subspace Emissary, or for larger stages, to have Pokemon Trainer physically follow the Pokemon around. However, in the final game, the trainer simply teleports to a new location instead of physically moving there. Now, not strictly related to characters, but a file can be found which seems to indicate that Ridley was going to be an assist trophy. However, this was probably made very early on before they decided to make Ridley and Meta Ridley bosses instead. Surprisingly, stages don't have very much change, though this was probably because information for Brawl was revealed on the website in screenshots rather than in videos shown at press shows, so they were able to limit exactly what was being shown. Still, a few fell through the cracks. First, Pokemon Stadium 2 was shown off with the giant screen lacking graphics, just like Pokemon Stadium 1 from Melee, and it's probably because they weren't programmed yet. Shadow Moses Island had an outdoors area, which is shown in a screenshot in a Nintendo World Report trailer. The E3 2006 trailer also has a few neat details in one shot. The first is that Snake's cardboard box can be seen in the background of the stage. This isn't possible in the normal game, and it was probably just done as a form of continuity for the Snake reveal which happened a few moments later. Second, you'll notice that Battlefield actually doesn't have any platforms. Now this was probably just to keep the trailer as clean as possible, but this could potentially be the very first Omega stage. While Omega forms were done as an olive branch to the competitive community in Smash 4, I think this is probably the earliest form of a Smash Bros stage that isn't Final Destination being entirely flat with no platforms. Brawl was also originally going to have a damage system that would impact the player's appearance the more damage they took. Sakurai discussed this in an interview, stating that not only would appearance be affected, but swords would break and equipment would be destroyed, sort of as a comeback factor. Players that lasted longer would be at more of a disadvantage, and Brawl's design was all about evening the playing field as much as possible. While this concept was ultimately scrapped, early textures still exist. Captain Falcon's helmet would break, revealing part of his eye and face. Meta Knight's mask would crack all the way across, and Link's shield and Master Sword would both have slices and cracks in them. As Sakurai said, they could both crack and break completely, and Link's Master Sword had some additional files indicating a completely broken Master Sword. Marth and Ike also have cracked textures for the Falchion and Ragnell, 
and Lucas even has broken textures for his stick back. Bridge of Elden has an unused model of Colin being tied to a spear. That gets exactly one yike from me, and it was ultimately covered up by other models on the stage. And lastly, 16 different characters have an additional trophy available showing a third pose, a feature which began in Melee. Modders have been able to apply these to the trophy model to show what it would have looked like in-game had this feature made it to the final version. So first, let's talk about scrapped characters. Now, I'm going to go through this bit a little fast because this is kind of common knowledge at this point, but there were a few characters that were changed up from the game's initial plan. First are, of course, the Ice Climbers, who were cut because the 3DS could apparently not handle the strain of having so many characters on the screen at once. The Wii U version of the game handled the character perfectly fine, even up to 8-player Smash, but it was due to Sakurai's wish that both games have an identical roster that the ICs were ultimately cut. The clones for this game, Dr. Mario, Lucina, and Dark Pit, were all planned to simply be costumes for their base characters, but they each had unique traits, so Sakurai felt that they would be better served as individual characters rather than costumes. And lastly, Alf was initially going to be a full clone who used Rock Pikmin in addition to the other Pikmin, but because of development constraints, he was merely made an alternate costume for Olimar. But there were a number of characters who were considered for the game that never actually made it in. Rhythm Heaven appears to have been more than considered, but actually implemented to some capacity. There's a named fighter emblem within the data that indicates Rhythm Heaven, and many speculate that this would have been the Chorus Kids, but for some reason, they never made it to the full game. Takamaru from the mysterious Murasame Castle was also considered, but Sakurai felt that outside of Japan, the character would be unfamiliar to players, and so he became an assist trophy instead. Krom was also considered, but he was passed over for Robin because Sakurai felt that there wasn't really anything unique Krom could bring over the other Fire Emblem characters already in the game. And lastly is Heiachi, a character from the Tekken series. Sakurai wrote in his book, Thoughts About Making Video Games 2, that Heiachi was considered to be playable for this game, likely because of their work with Bandai Namco, but that his moveset would be difficult to implement in Smash, and so he was ultimately simply made a Mii Fighter skin. But now, let's talk about some hopefully less known information, starting with the stages. First, a Kirby's Epic Yarn stage was initially planned to be in the game, but after Yoshi's Woolly World was announced, Sakurai wanted to make a stage based on that game, and so the Epic Yarn stage was then changed to the Great Cave Offensive. This was done to avoid any confusion between the two potential stages, because Epic Yarn and Woolly World both have a very similar art style, so in order to avoid any confusion, he simply got rid of the Epic Yarn stage entirely. A Super Mario Land stage was meant to be in the game, but it was changed into the Game Boy Dreamland stage. This was less of a replacement and more of a pivot, as they both had been Game Boy games and they were both going to have that same aesthetic of a Game Boy green stage, but instead of Mario Land, they picked Kirby. Magicant was planned to have a fully 3D modeled Flying Man as a stage hazard, but there was a concern that this extra model might put some strain on the 3DS hardware, and so it was replaced with a simple sprite from Earthbound, repurposing the full model later as a DLC costume. And lastly, Mario Circuit has an unused texture for a blue toad and a cart, suggesting that toads could be drivers on the track. However, in keeping with the seeming tradition, Shy Guys are the only drivers on any of the Mario Kart tracks. Now let's talk about Smash 3DS for a minute. There's not a ton of cut content found inside of the actual game, but that isn't to say that there's nothing. Inside the game's data, there exists a very small image of an early version of the boxing ring stage, but it has a few noticeable differences. The timer in the top right and the HUD at the bottom are both very clearly brawls, but of course the font of the percentages is an early version of Smash 4's. The background is also very different, with the placeholder image from Super Punch-Out being on the big Jumbotron. Interestingly, this same image was later found in Smash Ultimate's files, but in double the size, making it much clearer. But this isn't the only place that this image was found, as it can actually be seen in the background of the reveal trailer for Smash 4. It's honestly so quick that I'm pretty surprised that anyone noticed this, but there it is very plainly. When you compare the two images, you can very clearly see that that is this image. There are also leftovers from Kirby's final Smash from Brawl found on Smash 3DS. For the final game, this move is changed to the Ultra Sword, but the models and the textures for each of the utensils and items that Cook Kirby uses all still exist within the game, they're just never used. 
Everything else that goes unused in Smash 3DS is honestly pretty minor. There are extra graphics or textures or occasionally an extra model, but there's nothing too crazy. And I sort of attribute this to simple file size constraints. The 3DS carts really were limited in the amount of data that they could hold, so anything that wasn't being used was most likely removed because they definitely needed that precious space. But Smash for Wii U has a ton of extra data, probably because they had a much bigger file size to work with. There are text strings and animation files in Smash for Wii U that suggest that PD Piranha was once going to be a boss returning from Brawl. Interestingly, his file name was Boss Pakun, which is likely where Piranha Plant gets his internal name in Smash Ultimate, either because he's the same species as PD or because PD Piranha is literally his final Smash. Either way, nothing else exists for PD within the game, suggesting that he was cut pretty early into the idea. Kirby also has a few unused voice lines for Palutena. Both Japanese and English versions of Palutena's Heavenly Light and Explosive Flame custom moves can be found in the game. Heavenly Light, Explosive Flame! This suggests that the default neutral special had not been decided yet, or that Kirby could absorb a character's custom moves. Regardless, it's adorable hearing Kirby say these different lines. Mewtwo also has some Japanese voice lines of him actually speaking. All of these are used for his victory poses, and they're only used in the Japanese versions of the game. In the international release, Mewtwo doesn't speak at all. This was the exact same case for Melee as well. In the Japanese versions, he spoke, and in the international versions, he kinda either just laughed or didn't talk at all. A handful of characters who did not end up in the game actually have slots for announcer calls in the game's data. Ice Climbers, Pokemon Trainer, Squirtle, Ivysaur, Wolf, Snake, and the Fighting Alloy team all have space for this, but they were never put into the game and they were probably just ported from Brawl. If you access these files, they're just empty. Lucas also had this empty data slot, but it ended up being used eventually when he became a DLC fighter. Within the character select screen data, there are portraits for every single boss, despite none of them being selectable on this particular screen. Metal Face even seems to be T-posing. None of these images are used based on their location in the game, though some of this art is used elsewhere, such as in classic mode. But one portrait stands out among all of those, and that is a special render for the three viruses from Dr. Mario. This render suggests that not only were these three meant to be a boss character, but that there was going to be a Dr. Mario stage for them to appear on. Both the boss and the stage were ultimately scrapped, but the virus render was used as the template for the virus's trophy model in the game. For some reason, Roy has an additional ninth costume slot still in the game, it's just hidden. The costume for this slot is literally just default Roy, but it has lower resolution textures and it doesn't have his headband trails or his cape. No one really knows why this is. He's the only character in the game that has some hidden away costume like this. No one really knows what it's there for. But it's most likely just a development oversight. They probably just forgot it was there. Meta Knight, Pit, and Dark Pit all have animations for gliding, despite this function actually being completely removed from Smash 4. This is probably because Meta Knight and Pit were both ported directly from Brawl before they began modifying their moveset, and because Dark Pit is built off of Pit being his clone, he has those animations too. And speaking of ports, Roy has a second jab animation which is identical to both Marth and Lucina's. This goes entirely unused because Roy only has one jab attack, rather than the two that Marth has. And it's probably just a leftover from the animations being copied over from Marth's because Roy is of course a semi-clone of Marth. Likewise, Giga Mac has a set of animations that are probably just taken straight from Little Mac. Even though Giga Mac can't use the KO punch ability whatsoever, he has animations for using the move both on the ground and in the air. Back in Brawl, Diddy Kong had a set of laughing animations that went entirely unused, and they were most likely linked to Diddy snickering when one of the opponents trips on his bananas. Strangely, these animations are both in Smash 4 as well, though again, they are entirely unused, so that probably suggests that Diddy Kong was simply completely copy and pasted from Brawl to Smash 4. And lastly, for unused content, I would probably be yelled at if I didn't mention the Tharia Trophy. Thanks to the ESRB leak, which gave us a ton of information about the game well before its release, an image of a Tharia Trophy was shown off, but it's mysteriously missing from the game. In fact, the ESRB leak showed a total of 686 trophies, but the final official base game has only 685, 
leading Tharia to be the only missing trophy. It's widely believed that this was removed because her clothing is fairly suggestive and it may have come into conflict with the game's E10 rating. But regardless, we have photographic evidence that this existed, but I guess the ESRB just hates fun. But we're not entirely done, because this smash was unique at the time in that we had a ton of early footage to go off of as well as pre-release demos and things like that, so we actually got decent glimpses at the game in its beta state. First, the stock icons are way to the right of the player HUD rather than right underneath the character portrait. To me, this honestly looks almost like an error because they really just seem out of place where they're at in the beta. The font used for the Battle HUD is also slightly different. It's pretty close to what we got in the final game, it just looks a little less polished. But this kind of makes sense to me, because at these pre-release events, the developers are probably far more concerned about the game running in a stable state rather than how some graphics look. Those graphics can easily be fixed later, but if the game freezes on stage at a huge Nintendo livestream, that's kind of a big deal. So. They made sure that was working in proper order, and the other stuff was kind of just minor. The boxing ring stage also didn't have the characters' nicknames on the background. That's something that would eventually be added to give both the stage and the fighters a little bit more personality. One of the promotional images shows Fighter Link interacting with Conductor Link on the Spirit Track stage. This is actually impossible in the final version of the game, because if a player or CPU is fighting as Link or Toon Link, Conductor Link will actually not appear, instead it'll be Alfonso who will show up to drive the train and run into bombs and stuff. There's an image of the 3D Land stage which shows a slightly different layout as well as slightly duller colors. This is obviously just a pending form of the stage, obviously because it's in the beta, and the colors and the layout both would be tweaked for the final release. And finally, an early version of Ike's neutral special shows the move with red flames, which is the form that it took in Brawl. In the final game, this was adjusted to be kind of more game accurate, now being blue flames instead of red. I say kind of because while Ike never specifically uses a blue flame attack like the one he uses in Smash, in his home series, a goddess channels her energy through him, which is represented by blue flames surrounding him. In Japanese, he's also given the nickname the Hero of Blue Flames, so this could be a direct reference to that, but in the English versions, he's simply referred to as the Radiant Hero, so this reference is kind of lost on us. First up is Alucard, who was considered to be a representative for the Castlevania series due to the popularity of Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Overall though, Sakurai thought that the most number of people would be happy if he included two Belmonts, one that is popular overseas and one that was popular in Japan, and so that is how we ended up with both Simon and Richter. Most people would be familiar with one of those two fighters, even if it was just that they had heard of them, and so Alucard was made a simple assist trophy and a background stage character. Two game franchises didn't get picked up for Smash Ultimate's base roster merely because of poor timing. The project plan for Smash Ultimate was finished before the announcements of both ARMS and Xenoblade Chronicles 2. And because Sakurai didn't want to deviate from his project plan for fear of the game being delayed, neither of these franchises received full fighter reps. Instead, they received an assist trophy, Mii Fighter costumes, and spirits. Decidueye was also a potential fighter for the base roster, or at the very least was one of the heavy considerations. Sakurai knew going into Smash Ultimate that he wanted a Generation 7 Pokemon in the roster, but he wanted to wait until more of the Pokemon had been revealed before they made a final decision. After seeing all of the starters and presumably the rest of the Alola decks, Incineroar was ultimately decided on, likely because of the unique wrestling moveset that he could have. Sakurai stated in a Dragon Quest XI-S livestream that he was perfectly fine with turning a slime into a fighter if Square Enix denied his request for Hero. But of course, they fortunately were totally on board with this idea. He also originally planned for all eight of Hero's costume slots to be a different Dragon Quest protagonist, but time constraints for the DLC release left him only including four of the heroes and each of them receiving one recolor. And speaking of characters, several characters that were already in the Smash roster underwent very various changes from the reveal and the demo to the final release. Bayonetta had an unintended use of her side special, Afterburner Kick. If you used Afterburner Kick followed by a downward Afterburner Kick, she would gain a second Afterburner Kick. She's really only supposed to have two no matter what. 
and this was of course patched in the final release. Donkey Kong still has the model in his data for the bongo drums, which was used in his final smash in both Brawl and Smash 4. Strangely, despite not being used at all in Ultimate, the bongo drums model and textures both received updates to make them more high resolution and higher poly, which suggests that maybe the final smash was intended to return at some point before being replaced by Jungle Rush. Pac-Man had two significant changes to his moveset. In his character trailer, he was able to attack the water that sprays out of his hydrant, causing it to disappear. His trampoline was also apparently able to be attacked, turning it green and putting enemies into a helpless state when they interacted with it. Neither of these traits made it to the final game, and they instead act just as they did in Smash 4. Piranha Plant was originally going to have a third jump, however in the day one patch of Ultimate this was changed back to two jumps. The files for Piranha Plant existed on the 1.0.0 version of the game before any patches, and the animation can actually still be found in the data. In a similar fashion, Joker was going to have a rapid jab based on the early data mining of his files. However, this was changed and he simply has a 1-2-3 jab combo in the final release. King K. Rool's counter has a very strange coding scenario. The move's code states that he should take some damage during the counter, but the multiplier sets the taken damage to zero. Additionally, the game states that his counter uses Belly Super Armor, which is what the game refers to as K. Rool's passive ability to absorb hits up to a certain amount of damage. The theory is that rather than coding two entirely separate systems, the counter move is simply given Belly Super Armor with no damage. This way it saves developers time and also allows them to use the same sound effect for both abilities. Olimar's data includes the animations for his old Pikmin Chain recovery, as well as the Pikmin's pummel animation. However, Pikmin Chain was replaced by Winged Pikmin as a recovery move, and Olimar pummels the opponent himself rather than forcing his Pikmin to. Every character with the ability to glide and brawl still retains the code for the ability, just like they did in Smash 4. Strangely though, Ridley, a brand new character, also has code which would hypothetically allow him to glide, if the ability was in the game in the first place. It's pretty weird that Ridley would have this, but one theory is that Charizard served as a base for Ridley, and since Charizard has that code carried over, Ridley got it when they basically copy and pasted Charizard. This doesn't really seem to suggest that gliding would make a comeback, as Ridley has no animation that matches the gliding, he simply has the code inside of his data. Mr. Game & Watch's main change is pretty well known due to some social media backlash. Prior to Ultimate's release, Mr. Game & Watch changed appearance far more drastically during his forward smash based on the Fire Attack Game & Watch title. The design in the original game was based on a stereotype for Native Americans, and it received some backlash once it was discovered in the leak of Smash Ultimate. Upon official release, however, the Day 1 patch removed the feather. Game & Watch's old forward smash is actually seen in this clip in Pikachu's trailer for the Smash website. The animation for this was obviously changed, but it's clear that they filmed this trailer before the change to his forward smash was officially finished. Link has an unused model of a fairy in his files. This is most likely just a leftover from Smash 4, as Link receives a new taunt that no longer uses the fairy. In Rosalina's trailer on the Smash Ultimate website, her final smash is simply a giant power star. However, in the final version of Ultimate, it was changed to be a Grand Star. All of the Yoshis in Yoshi's Final Smash use textures from the exact same file in the game. Every color is lumped together, but strangely, Crafted Yoshi is actually on this image as well. This is kind of strange because Crafted Yoshi actually does not appear in the Final Smash whatsoever, but every other color of Yoshi does. This could suggest that Crafted Yoshi was originally going to be in the Final Smash, or that they simply transferred it over in a quick way and left it there because they really didn't need to remove it because it wasn't being used for anything. Bowser's character files have a placeholder file for the reticle that is used during Giga Bowser's Final Smash. It's a very basic circle with crosshairs and it has some Japanese text across it which literally translates to temporary. The final game of course has a far more polished reticle, but this was not actually removed from the game's files. The stages for Ultimate also have a couple of changes, but they're nothing really too crazy. First, a pre-release screenshot shows the Knuckles Assist Trophy on Green Hill Zone. In the final game, however, this is impossible, as the Assist Trophy is entirely disabled for this stage. The reason for this is that Sonic characters will randomly run in the background of the stage, and Knuckles being a part of that, 
it would look out of place in the event that Knuckles was fighting and running in the background at the same time. Although we are talking about a game where eight different Marios can all fight each other all at the same time, but you know, whatever. The Memento stage has music from all of the Persona games, including several remixes made specifically for Smash. Both Aria of the Soul and Beneath the Mask were remixed for Smash, but in the game's data, you can find the original tracks in full, completely unedited from the original Persona game. It's unclear why they're in the game, but it could be because they weren't sure which songs they would remix when Joker was decided, or they were simply used as placeholders until the remixes were completed and they simply weren't removed. At the Computer Entertainment Developers Conference 2019 in Japan, development slides were shown off discussing Smash Ultimate's design process, ranging from art styles and technical development to simple development strategies as a whole. During this presentation, concept art was shown for Battlefield that shows that 18 different concepts and designs were considered and revised before the development team arrived at the version that we got in the final game. There is also a mysteriously unused mode called Convention in the game's files. This mode has never been used through all of Smash Ultimate's updates, and nothing in the code suggests what the point of the mode would be. There are only two images associated with this, which would have been menu preview graphics. Both are of the flaming Smash Ball used in the teaser trailer, and one has Incineroar, Pit, and Fox on it. And speaking of modes, the classic modes for both Pokemon Trainer and Mega Man were both meant to have stamina routes with 120 HP for each fight. However, while this metric is set in the code, the stamina mode is disabled. Unfortunately, it seems that at one point they were going to have these routes, but they were decided against, and so only Ryu, Hiro, and Terry have stamina classic routes as of today's video. Sakurai stated in an interview that he had planned for a mechanic that would counter a campy playstyle. In the same way that there is a mechanic that punishes heavy dodgers by slowing down their ability to dodge, the plan was to lower the run speed to make running away harder for a campy player. But this was scrapped because it proved incredibly difficult to gauge what a campy playstyle was. There's a model for Dragonite that differs from the one found on Kalos Pokemon League. This one is far more detailed and it matches the lighting and art style for the rest of Ultimate, suggesting that Dragonite was at one point going to be a possible Pokemon for the Pokeball item. As I said in my last video, Smash for 3DS has a random beta screenshot of the boxing ring stage hidden in its files. For some reason, this is carried over into Ultimate, but it's in double the resolution. There's no real explanation for this as the image isn't used anywhere in the game, but I guess it's an interesting find nonetheless. And lastly, we have a fact about Sans Undertale. There's an unused texture on the Mii Gunner outfit, which when mapped to the model, would be used for his big blue glowing eye but unfortunately this is never actually seen in use in the final costume. Which is kind of a shame, but hey, we got Sans and Smash, so really, we can't complain.